going to be primarily a, a question and answer session. We have three highly regarded specialists that are in the area of the treatment field. And the issue of treatment, we know, can guide or misguide or destroy the success of someone who has already gone through a sentencing and usually some period of incarceration. So the issue of treatment and how well the person on the registry is to be successful is critical. It's not only critical to that person, but to that person's family and all of their community of support, the churches uh, to which they belong, the communities in which they live, all of these things are critical. Uh, added to the program listing, we have Dr. George Dyson, starting here from my left to the right. Um, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to tell a little bit about themselves and their work. You heard from Dr. Guy, and then seated in the center is, is our Florida person, Dr. Eric Imhoff. Eric is a wonderful spokesperson on behalf of the truth. He'll be doing a, a session tomorrow about myth, and uh, he's working with us, especially in Florida, around the issues of um, child pornography and such. He has come to our and then on the far end is Dr. Phil Taylor. I met Phil last year in St. Louis, and um, we talked about the some of the bunk that goes on in treatment. So if I may begin, Dr. Geisen, would you like to give a little bit of a biographical background, anything you want to share? Uh, sure. I'm happy to, uh, to be here to address the group this afternoon and look forward to a dynamic uh, kind of interplay. Um, I, uh, I was trained as a clinical psychologist. When I started graduate school in psychology, I did not at all think I would end up here um, you know, doing this kind of work. But um, I had also strongly uh, desired a, uh, a sort of a specialty, something that sort of set me apart from uh, the average general practitioner. And, and so um, you know, back in the you know, early two, 2001, 2002, um, a mentor of mine uh, introduced me to doing this kind of work, doing uh, uh, assessments for persons, uh, you know, uh, charged with sex offenses. And then I got a position at uh, a forensic hospital in the state and dealt with uh, some, some very, uh, very troubled persons. Um, learned a lot about the institutionalization of persons who are mentally ill, but have also uh, been sort of, um, you know, they were mentally ill, but had also commit, uh, committed a sex offense. And learned about sort of institutional, what I sort of call institutional denial, and that. Uh, you know, the hospital and the state didn't actually believe that these persons actually had a had a sexual drive. In many cases, they had, they had responded well to treatment, had been there for many many years, and had families. And uh, so there was a whole issue around around that. So it's just been one thing after one after another after another. Uh, for the past six or seven years, I've been in private practice and mostly uh, consulting to public defenders in the state of Connecticut. Um, I'm a member of the Connecticut Association of Treatment of Sex Offenders. I'm a recognized expert in the state of Connecticut and um, do mostly uh, assessment and some treatment. And that's because um, oftentimes people are referred to me for treatment. They're also sort of paired up with a probation officer, uh, as uh, Tamara Lay was saying. Uh, I mean, sometimes the dialogue between myself from a clinical perspective, from a treatment perspective, and, you know, uh, when matched up with a probation perspective or community management perspective doesn't exactly uh, jive. So once they sort of hear me, so, you know, and sort of my thoughts about a person and try and rehabilitate them and treat them, because I'm a clinical psychologist first. I mean, it's all, it is about treatment. Um, you know, they sort of, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Geisen. <laughs> Moving right along. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Um, but, uh, I I don't really know what to say, but I guess in 93, I started uh, in this field, uh, I guess like Dr. Geisen, not by plan, but that was the first job I could get. Uh, and it was with a, uh, a residential population of juvenile offenders. Um, but I quickly became very, very interested in not only the mental health issues that they had, but also the interplay of the sexual behavior problems and all those kind of played together. Um, I worked as a therapist case manager at this facility for about seven years. Closer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, my God. 
uh, and then kind of got tired of working for a large mental health company. So I came to Florida to work actually for a, a smaller mental health company that was providing services for uh, DJJ in a, a secure residential facility. Uh, that lasted about seven months um, due to management changes and I was out on the street because I wasn't one of the new people. Uh, and I started going to practice in 2000, mostly doing evaluations. I also did, to kind of fill in the gaps, I, I did some treatment uh, for a colleague of mine for a group of federal probationers, which is how I got introduced into the child pornography field and then was asked to come testify on behalf of the guys that were in my group. And one thing led to another, and now I predominantly do that, that type of work. Uh, and that's what my presentation will be on tomorrow. So that's a little bit about me. I'm Phil Taylor. And uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the uh, promotion to doctor. Actually, uh, I'm a master's level private practitioner. Um, I uh, kind of echo uh, previous statements about uh, how I got into this uh, area. I had the bright idea that I was going to have a practice that focused on men and male issues, and uh, because uh, in Dallas, about every other street corner has a uh, therapist focusing on women's issues, and they seem to be doing really well. Uh, but I quickly found out that uh, men don't come in for therapy unless, unless they are ordered by their wives or a judge. And so I went to where the clientele were, and that, so I did my, my uh, internship uh, in a private uh, practice that had several sex offender treatment groups. And uh, I've did, I did uh, sex offender treatment for 15 years, uh, a little less than that. Uh, I now refer to myself as a sex offender treatment provider in remission uh, because <laughs> I don't do sex offender treatment anymore. I don't have any treatment clients and uh, I do not miss uh, dealing with folks who are mandated into treatment and having to uh, negotiate with their POs. Um, I do uh, evaluations for defensive returns and that's mostly what I do. Uh, so, um, uh, how shall we start? We have begun, and I find that very interesting, and we already have uh, questions, and we have uh, a, a, a van, not a vanna, circulating the, um, the, the room now with the microphone. First question, please. Uh, real quick, and I think I know Phil's answer to this, because we've talked about it at night. The other two gentlemen. What do you think about the ethics of the same practitioner doing both the evaluation and then providing the treatment if they say that person needs the treatment? Okay. Um, you, want, okay. you want it to any specific person or any or all? How about all? How about all? Okay, gentlemen. Go ahead. Uh, well, I uh, most of my work, uh, as it turns out. Um, is an assessment. Uh, most, of the, most of the work that I do, the, the work that I really enjoy doing is assessment, testing, evaluation. Um, I'm a frustrated writer and I often say, you know, I, I, I wanted to study journalism in school, but I do more writing now than I ever, ever thought I would do. So, uh, but um, to answer the question, I, um, I really don't, uh, I don't, for me anyway, I don't feel like it's, uh, it's appropriate for me to, to do both roles. Uh, I think um, for for me it would be while on one, on the one hand you could you know people have argued well you know Dr. Geisen you know this person you know better than anybody I mean you know the whole history ins and outs I mean certainly you would be the one I I just I, I just feel uncomfortable uh, with it we, we had one relationship uh, as a uh, you know as a uh, examiner examinee I evaluated them I evaluated them for their attorney or for the court and my work is done. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about it, so I, why I believe it. 
Well, I'm not sure I can be that concise. Um, I think it's probably the biggest ethical violation in psychology that's committed. Um, it's in the APA guidelines, uh, even I think more so in the forensic specialty guidelines, which I don't know have been published yet. They, I've seen them in draft. Um, but, and, and here's the, here's the reason for that. Um, it, it works both ways, I guess. If you do the initial evaluation and you find this person needs treatment and then you refer them to your own treatment facility or, or program, it's a conflict of interest because you're benefiting from your decision. So you, you may have some bias there because you want that guy in your treatment program where you're really gonna make the money. The evaluations, and, and I'll speak for Florida, I don't know other states, but I see a lot of this in, in particularly the Miami area. They'll do an evaluation, which is you know a couple hour interview. They'll write a two page report and say, this guy needs treatment, put him in my treatment program. So the evaluation they do for $200. But the guy's gonna be in treatment potentially for five years. So they're gonna make a lot more money there. So there's, there's an inherent bias there. The other way that it becomes problematic is when you treat the client and then you make an evaluation and recommendation to the court. We all like to believe we do good work. So of course we're gonna have an inherent bias to believe that the client is better because of our work with them. Um, and we lose our objectivity that way. And that can be just as damaging if the individual truly hasn't done everything they need to do in treatment. So. Thank you. Bill? Well, yes, I, I agree that it's a uh, conflict of interest, but in the uh, sticky world of mandated treatment, uh, there are some interesting twists and turns. And uh, in the past, I have had situations where I would do an evaluation, and uh, until recently, until the last couple of years, I, like every good sex offender treatment provider would say that some treatment was needed. Now, I don't say that much anymore. Uh, but if you say treatment is needed and then they go and get uh, a plea bargain, come out on uh, probation, and they say, I want to go see Phil Taylor. Uh, Judge, can I do that? And then I look around at the other providers and I say, well, <laughs> what's the guy to do? That's the kind of uh, uh, conflict and crossfire that it's good to be out of. Just to maybe kind of amplify a little bit on, on what Phil was saying. Um, yeah, it is, it is a clear conflict of interest, and so I thank Eric for kind of clarifying that. But one of the other barriers I, I find, too, with respect to treatment uh, is that I, I don't, I do not absolutely, I don't do mandated treatment. Um, for some personal reasons, professional reasons, I, I really don't feel like uh, I'm personally not very comfortable um, reporting or feeling like I have to or I'm obliged to report information to uh, a probation officer. So typically I don't, I don't get folks referred to me for mandated treatment. I, I don't like to work under those constraints. If someone is, uh, has the means, and um, I, mean, I do, in my, my practice, I do take some insurance, and if they have insurance, I'll, I'll treat them individually. But they're an individual client at that point of mine, and we have a private relationship. And even if probation wants information, then I, I work with the person very closely to, to, to sort of discuss what I'll release under what conditions. Uh, probation does not like that. But, you know, say la vie. I mean, it is a private relationship that I have with, with, uh, with my patient. So. And just to follow up, I mean, do you think that there should be a movement in sex offender treatment where you have? a specific evaluator over here and then a separate treatment provider here. We have two different disciplines within the overall umbrella. Uh, I can only speak for the, the state of Connecticut. Uh, there's, a, there's an organization, it's a lot like ATSA, but it functions on a state level. And typically, you know, people will be referred you know, within that network. Some of, and some of us will only do, all we do is assessment, some of us will do only treatment. And some do a little bit of both, uh, but again, not not eating from the same trough, so to speak. It's, there's no conflict of interest there. So I'll have the court to actually ask for that. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to get in on that question. I think uh, a better idea would be to have a have a rule that uh, clients may choose their therapists uh, either at the beginning or at uh, any juncture in between. 
provided they don't change therapists more than three times a year. Uh, but uh, that would uh, create some market forces that would improve the quality of the treatment, uh, the small T treatment that the um, folks are getting. Okay, great. I'm going to come over to this side of the room to Donna from Missouri, and then just to be thinking ahead, Julius, and then to you, our gentleman in the brilliant blue shirt. <laughs> so you can be thinking ahead. My question, Phil, has a little bit to do with what you just said, being able to choose your treatment provider. Oh, I don't like my voice. <laughs> we, love, we do. Um, my son, when he uh, comes home in 2013, after being in a federal facility for 71 months, sorry, uh, will be on lifetime probation in the state of Missouri, which is what they do now at the federal level. In his regulations, he has to be in counseling while he's on probation. So that means for the rest of his life. That will be court-appointed counseling, which means we can't pick. So my question to the board here is, would it be in the best interest of my son to also have a counselor that we chose so that if and when the day comes after I talk to Bob, we're going to fight this fight to get him off of lifetime probation, would it be beneficial to have two reports? Okay, two. Um, uh, Chosen one and an appointed one, gentlemen. I think it's pretty easy to cover people up with cannabis therapy, particularly if they're not choosing it voluntarily. I don't, uh, <clears throat> I don't know what uh, he and his therapist, his uh, sex offender treatment provider, will find to talk about for the next uh, <laughs> 20 years. He's only 24, so it's got uh, a long time. In. Uh, um, and, and to have a separate therapist sometimes can be complicating in the therapist may go to war with each other. And he kind of caught in the middle. One therapist saying, you're seeing an idiot. And the other saying, you're seeing somebody who doesn't know anything about sex offenders. And there you go. Um, let me respond in two ways, if I may. Uh, Florida uh, has what they call contract by county or by circuit um, and basically there's no money attached to this contract it's more like you're the preferred provider for this circuit and that's where the guy goes uh, the guy has no choice the treatment providers have become for lack of a better word kind of draconian with the guys um, and basically threaten and intimidate and all kinds of different things uh, which has created a lot of problems and, and uh, uh, you know, I'm a member of that, so I'm a member of FATSA, our, our state chapter, and, and FATSA did a lot of work trying to change that, where they would go to multiple providers per um, county. And we made some inroads, we made some progress, because uh, as long as the, the provider is deemed qualified by DOC probation and parole, they can go to any of these guys, or should be able to go to any of these guys. So that system is kind of growing county to county to county, which is a good thing, because then there'll be you know more people to choose from, Competition comes in, the better provider is going to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is you have some probation officers who have formed relationships with some providers and they like the tough on the guy, guy, you know, uh, treatment provider. Um, so you run into all these kinds of problems. But that's another way to address the issue is try and make some change in the state system. Um, and, you know, we did it through our relationship with DOC. We were lucky enough to have a good relationship with DOC, particularly probation and parole. Actually, a probation officer moved up to, you know, head of probation and parole that we had known for a long time, or one of our members had known for a long time. So the relationships are really important. The issue about having dual counselors, uh, I think that, uh, what uh, Mr. Taylor said is certainly uh, right on target. Um, and ethically, uh, as psychologists, we would have to disclose to the other counselor that we're working with the other person so as not to create any kind of conflict. Um, that may or may not be something you want for your son. <laughs> right. um, and then, I think as Mr. Taylor said, that's going to lead to conflict between the two uh, providers. So that become, there can be some benefits to that, I can see. Your son may benefit from having someone 
not court appointed to kind of go to and talk about issues and stress of being in a court appointed program. <laughs> um, but I think you'll end up running into conflicts and uh, you know the, the court appointed one saying this person's not qualified to be doing this, et cetera. So I can see that ending up in kind of a mess. It would be something you'd have to handle very carefully. <laughs> Um, no, I mean it's uh, yeah, it's interesting listening to the conversation. I, I keep going back to in my state. Um, in, in my state, it's a, it's a very peculiar situation in that there's a you know there's a state association that works very closely with the courts, um, and has become kind of the uh, you know the go-to official agency for uh, for courts ordering people to be treated. Um, for sex offense related behaviors. It's the same agency also that tends to, it, it's the same agency that, that also certifies clinical members to become part of their guild. And so I'm often in the position of kind of, you know, wanting to preserve a little bit of a barrier between my own uh, you know, kind of thoughts and feelings, not wanting to become part of that subsystem, um, and certainly not wanting. Um, I just, there's times when I sort of feel like, you know, it's a small state um, and the one agency there that um, the judges turn to when they say someone needs a sex offense evaluation or someone needs to be in treatment is the same entity that actually qualifies people to do these evaluations. And so there's a part of me that likes to steer clear of that when I can. So. Can, can I just... Yes, Don, did you want to expand on your question? Just, what about then if I want he wanted to, we wanted to have him risk assessed after a year by someone else other than who he was. Would that also be considered a conflict of? Are you all hearing Donna's question over here? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I would say no, uh, because it's not an ongoing relationship. And, and I actually do some of those types of evaluations, but I'm very careful with the attorney to explain the potential ramifications, particularly for the client. Gotcha. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that, you know, that the courts can't prevent you from doing that. But they may not pay much attention to the evaluation that uh, comes along if it differs <coughs> from, the, from their man. Uh, Thank you. And this is about their expertise, but we'll talk. Okay. Uh, Julius. From the standpoint of registry reform, the respective organizations that the three of you may or may not belong to. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we got that. Well, I can't believe that. Uh, can you explain or let me know if your organizations have any official position or interest in joining in the reform fight, or is, or is it your own individual efforts? Oh, okay. okay. Your organizational position? Or uh, is it more from your individualized uh, you, you mean drive? the, 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 the uh, professional the organization? Have a, a reform uh, viewpoint. Do they want to see the registry reform? You're talking about something like ATSA? That's a yeah, whatever yeah. organization may be willing to yeah. officially. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know what they are. And I may I interject? I, I would think everyone in the room knows the acronym for ATSA. At the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. And it's the, uh, actually it's an international group. I think that's, uh, uh, Dr. Garrison hit it on the nose when you refer to the, to uh, licensed sex offender treatment providers and uh, ATSA as, as guilds rather than professional associations. And the guild is uh, set up to channel business uh, to a small uh, cattle. Uh, but in, to Axe's credit, they take a uh, slightly left of no position position. Uh, they uh, say that many opinions about this, and there isn't any data that shows that it does any good, and uh, that's kind of the official position that I understand that they take. Uh, Alicia Klein and I would prop, I would say probably 60 percent of ATSA members themselves are almost rapidly <laughs> in favor of reform on this issue. 
but they don't speak for the association. Eric, is that your take on it? Right. I mean, I, I, the first thing I'd like to say is I can't speak on behalf of ATSA, nor could I speak on behalf of ATSA uh, and the positions, but I, I would agree. I mean, ATSA's position, I think, has always been more of uh, we're going to provide the information and the research, uh, and they kind of stop there. Uh, I don't think that they want to become that politically active. I mean, that's been kind of my perception, um, but they will provide information and requests, but I don't think they're going to get in the trenches and fight. Uh, I, I really, I, I, I don't think the professional organizations are motivated to do that because it doesn't so much affect them or us. Um, the, where change is going to come is from you guys because you're directly affected by it. Um, the professional organizations, I think, in general, are just going to kind of stand off. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'll stop there. My comments may not be so nice. <laughs> some of my colleagues. But I, I would just, uh, I would just, you know, echo some um, what Dr. Imhoff just said. Um, again, I, I'm not a member of ATS. I'm just a member of the, of the Connecticut, Psych, uh, Connecticut Psych Association, also the Connecticut Association of Treatment Sex Offenders. Um, from time to time to time, I get a little bit worn down and thinking that I'm, I'm I think I'm. Uh, Private, I'm a private practitioner, I have a solo private practice. I think privately I'm a, I'm a more progressive person in my mindset about reform and about a lot of just sort of the egregious kind of misapplications and overreachings of things like registry. Um, and from time to time I get pretty worn out thinking that this, this, this state association uh, doesn't quite get it until I go to a meeting or until I network with some colleagues and I find out they are, as Phil Taylor said, rabid about it. Um, but the manner in which they choose to, I think, kind of express that, that, that rabidness, if that's the word, um, I think is uh, they, they do it through um, some legislative work, some under the, sort of under the radar kind of legislative work. Uh, it's very, it's, uh, they don't want to take a real public stance. In our, in our state, the registry is run by the Department of Public Safety, which is the state police, and I think that they're very careful about not wanting to put themselves at odds with that organization, that entity. So it's a very delicate balance. You know, privately, I'm, I'm, I mean, there's just, we could all, I'm sure, say, you know, there's many, many, many hundreds of cases where the folks in the registry have been just, you know, grossly, uh, you know, um, really horribly treated by, by its restrictions and so forth. But, um, you know, it, it, I think, as, as Dr. Imhoff said, I think, through your efforts, I was, as I said earlier this morning, I was, I was actually amazed. I felt like I was coming into a room of experts, and I really felt like I was the newbie. You know, <laughs> I was like, you guys, you guys knew all this stuff, and I do think it does come from ground, the ground, ground level up. So yeah. To, um, to address in the area of faith-based, in terms of the treatment and the treatment that you provide, is there any opportunity for faith-based? Um, support to be given in the treatment? Do you see a role where the faith, where regardless of what the faith might be, uh, to play in, in the treatment from your experiences? I know I've gotten into thin ice territory. I've got an answer, but that's a whole other breakout session. <laughs> I, I, I can, let me take a stab at it. Um, the best way to address that, I think, is circles of support. There's kind of a movement um, called circles of support um, where basically individuals, you know, who are in the community are surrounded by not only the church, but, you know, employers and friends and family. Um, and it addresses some of the issues that were raised, I guess, by Dr. Geisen this morning about, you know, how all these things are important in reducing risk. Um, and so, yes, it's a very important factor in, in success for the individuals of reintegration. I don't know if that else? answers the question. Anything else from our panel? Well, there's treatment, and then there's treatment, and then there's treatment. <laughs> and uh, uh, psychotherapy is one thing. Sex offender treatment is something entirely different. And uh, a, a religious person can conduct psychotherapy. Uh, I don't. 
What it adds to the mix has not been, to my knowledge, uh, empirically verified. Uh, but if it makes the medicine go down easier, then that's fine with me. Uh, so long as the therapist that you're dealing with uh, at least has a passing acquaintance with the psychological literature. Well, that probably, uh, that probably is, is as effective as, as sex offender treatment is, right. because sex offender <laughs> treatment has not managed over the past 30 years to uh, demonstrate any treatment effect. So if you're going to have people go into treatment, you might as well go to a treatment of your own design. It uh, is probably as effective and maybe doesn't do as much harm. And, and to just move it, I, I, I want to see first, Dr. Geisen, did you want to add to well, this? Well, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, in, in terms of, of treatment, I think as we're talking about, and the, the word faith came up, um, I think that there was, uh, you know, um, immediately people began to think about Christian faith. Um, but, you know, there, there is, um, there's an organization, I'm sure people are familiar with it, uh, SLAA. Uh, there's SLA, uh, these are 12-step um, organizations, circles of support, and very, very big on, on spiritual support um, coming out of a 12-step model. Um, and also in my own private practice, I incorporate elements of, of Eastern religion uh, in terms of some of the cognitive kinds of reframing and work that I do with folks. So it's not, it's not Christian, it's not faith-based, but it is absolutely spiritual in nature. So just that to further the muddy the waters around this issue. And, um, and so my question to the panel members is, um, what are your thoughts on options on reform to take at least some people off registries? And to what extent would those reforms, su success of those reforms hinge on psychological assessment and treatment versus a formula-based, not so scientific uh, approach and what do you think might work? So it's kind of pitting your professions, which are scientific and rational, against a somewhat irrational system that we have today. And this is just ideas for us to think about. Thank you. I don't think there's any way to make a unjust, <laughs> unjust system fair. Uh, the formulaic approach uh, is bound to have uh, folks that are caught where Adam Walsh at catches them, uh, placing them in categories on the basis of what they did, not on the basis of any scientific research that's been done about recidivism. As far as predicting who might reoffend, I think uh, uh, Tamara Leif uh, made it pretty clear that uh, an objective observer would have to admit that we, don't, we can't predict anything about an individual. As close as we can come are categories of risk. Uh, and yet we're making individual judgments uh, on something that is uh, about as weak a piece of research <coughs> as you can find, uh, if you're going to use it for individuals. So uh, I think that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a bit of a revolutionary. I think that we're going to have to uh, modify or change the model we use to think about what we call sex offenders uh, before we can make much progress. If we're going to make progress at all, it's going to be the way most laws uh, uh, like this get, get modified a piece at a time, and they always start with children and and uh, Romeo and Juliet cases, and uh, folks that appeal to the heart. Uh, I think eventually, uh, when the heart gets involved, then they can see a little further, perhaps. But uh, nobody cares about sex offenders. They might care about teenage sex offenders. They might care about 12-year-olds. I don't know. I, that's, that's stretching. Uh, I don't think you could have asked a more complicated question. <laughs> I think we could stay here for two days and, and try and figure this out. Um, I, I think, number one, the research is pretty clear. Registration doesn't work. Uh, we're wasting lots and lots of money doing it. 
Um, I know Ms. Lee had a quote, but I, I think the uh, actual cost in 2007 to the state of New Jersey was $3.7 million uh, for the registration. Megan's lower. I think hers was a bit lower than that. Um, so it comes at a great cost for a little yield, actually no yield, uh, and may in fact make things more dangerous uh, for our communities. Uh, so really the way to go is abolish it. I mean, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, think, if you think about it, if, if a company had uh, you know, a, a procedure or had purchased some equipment that didn't work, would they continue to invest in it? I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I think that's the problem with the government. There's too much politics involved. Um, and too much gets in there that has nothing to do with empirical research. So anyway, enough about that. So if we can abolish it, abolish it, because it doesn't work. Uh, if you're going to reform it, there's ways to reform it, and you can certainly uh, benefit from some of the empirical research. I'll disagree a bit with Ms. Leave on the actuarial risk assessment. Uh, it is not perfect. I will admit that. It's a moderate predictor of um, recidivism. But it is way, way better than having a clinician sit down, do an interview, and go, hey, I think this guy's dangerous. I think he's not. If we're going to do this, we need to use actuarial risk assessments. Can the actuarial risk assessments be improved? Absolutely. Um, and there are ways to do that. There's also uh, the actuarial risk assessments don't account for everything either. I mean, there's static and dynamic risk assessment factors that need to be examined as well, more specific to the individual. Um, but those tools do give us the ability to categorize low, high, and medium risk. If we're going to use, um, if we're going to have uh, registration, we're going to have notification, we should be doing it on more of a tiered system. And here's, here's the really important reason why, is because if everything's, I use the old saying, if somebody says to you everything's important, well, if nothing's important, everything can't be important. Uh, and that's the way that I know Florida treats uh, the registration. Everybody's dangerous. Well, not everybody's dangerous. And the problem is, is we've got law enforcement, we've got the courts, we've got um, probation officers spending a lot of time watching the low-risk guys and not enough time watching the high-risk guys. Um, so we're giving too much resources to the low-risk guys, not enough to the high-risk guys, and that's making the situation more dangerous. And we're spreading our, spreading our probation officers way too thin. That point was made today. Um, so if we use the science we have uh, to make better decisions, to reform registration for now, that's, in my opinion, that's the way to go. And I think it really does require an individualized assessment. Uh, sure, you can have a probation officer sit down and give the static 99 or something like that, but that's not going to hit everything. Um, you brought up the issue of time and aging. Um, aging certainly does have an effect. That would be accounted for in an actuarial risk assessment. Uh, time also does have a dramatic effect. Um, what we do know is that the highest rates of recidiv recidivism occur between about three and five years post-release. Those are the most dangerous periods. There's kind of that honeymoon period where everybody's really nervous watching themselves. Then they kind of relax and that's where most of it occurs. Um, so those are the real critical times. Uh, after about um, between five and ten years, post-release or return to risk, as we say, um, risk is reduced by about half if the individual has had no uh, significant problems with the law enforcement. Uh, and by significant, I mean incurring or committing some kind of offense that would incur at least a minimum jail sentence. I'm not talking about technical violations of probation. So if you consider someone's been out um, for uh, about eight years, their risk is going to be cut in half. Whatever was assessed initially by the actual risk assessment or the initial risk assessment, it's going to be about half. We do nothing else. Um, treatment does work. Um, there's studies out there, meta-analyses of treatment programs and treatment studies. Some of them show that it reduces risk by 37%. Others show it reduces risk by 9%. Uh, this is kind of a new area, and I think as time goes on, we'll see some more consistency between those numbers. So participation in treatment can reduce risk, too. So we need to account for all of these different things in assessing the individual risk. But I don't know if that hit all of the points you raised, but I think I got them all. But I'm hoping, because I really don't have much to add, <laughs> <laughs> except to say that one of the things that does, uh, that does kind of, uh, has always kind of sort of stupefied me some is is what, what is the, the per obviously the purpose of notification is to let people 
you know, no. And we, I mean, know that there's a person who's on the registry and that and we need to know that they're on. But I've, I've often wondered about what does the average citizen do really with that information? I mean, I, I mean, it might seem like a silly question, but like, I remember when I was a, my, my daughter's PTO president, um, the only Mayo president ever on PTO, and, um, and we had someone in the PTO who wanted to create a registry within a registry in the neighborhood, and I was, you know, aghast at that. I was like, you know, this is preposterous. I mean, this is just, you know, and set up the neighborhood watches, and so I'm like, what are we watching for? I mean, what, I mean, what, what, so I've often wondered, with respect to the registry, there's, there's a couple of things. One, one is there's a, there's a, there's a, a cultural chasm between uh, the, the forces and entities in place that are really behind the, the registry or support the registry, I should say. Um, and you know, folks on my end of the spectrum, you know, people who are into kind of rehabilitation and treatment, really doing good assessment and so forth, we often don't speak the same language. It's kind of Mars and Venus, you know. But I have often wondered about the average, you know, John Q, the public member of the Common Ruck, who's, you know, got nothing better to do except dial up this, you know, thing on the internet, and look at these names of these people, these faces, and kind of go, I don't know, mildly interesting. What's for dinner? I mean, I, I really don't, you know, I really don't, don't honestly know. I don't think it does anything to, to anybody except it's kind of instill fear and sort of inspire kind of, you know, people to become all kind of worked up and. You know, we can go on and on and on about the cultural fear of this country and aggression. Yeah. Let me add something on that. I'm, I read an article that was done shortly after uh, Megan Kanka was murdered. Uh, and the reporter had uh, not been able to talk with her mother, but uh, was able to talk with all the neighborhood, neighbors in the neighborhood. And uh, they said, we all knew where that guy lived, and we're pretty sure she knew where that guy lived too. So if having Megan's law in effect would not have uh, helped Megan, it's a pretty good bet it doesn't help anybody. It does not add any increment of deterrence at all. I have to say, kind of amplifying that too, not not to inspire fear and so forth as I just talked about, but I have, I have worked with, with people uh, who are on electronic anklets, GPS monitoring on the registry, and have told me flatly, you know, community notification be damned, anklet be damned, if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. And there's nothing you're gonna do that's gonna stop me. So that kind of, yeah, you know, I mean, I was like, okay. Because I know where I stand here, I guess. But I mean, and that's, that, that's kind of, I mean, in a, in a way, sort of points out that the absurdity, I think, of, of of the registry. Uh, I think that there are some truly dangerous people who do need, society does need to know exist and know where they're at and what they're doing, but how we go about doing that and how we ferret out, you know, people who actually, that small three to five percent of people who actually do pose a very, very serious risk to the public, uh, serial offenders, re-offenders, serial sex offenders, um, it's, it, you know, until we figure out a way to do that, I think that it's just, it's largely a, bit of a very useless tool and I think it, it, bridges, it bridges liberties and, and uh, it's, it's a very troublesome thing. Um, most of my questions answered, but I do want to ask you. Um, we heard in the last presentation that uh, risk assessment doesn't work and so on and so forth, and she wasn't real um, on top of that. I tend to disagree. However, uh, with that being said, and the way you've answered the other gentleman's question, is where do you think, where in the process, once somebody is arrested and charged with these, with, with sex offense, where do you think from that point forward, that risk assessment as a tool should be in, should be utilized, and what effect should it have on the court? Uh, post conviction, pre sentencing, uh, because I think what we can do is, and I actually that, that's where I come in in federal court with child pornography cases, mostly, because then it, it's providing the court with information about risk and also information about management and what can we do to help this individual be successful in the least restrictive environment. Uh, and there's things unique to the individual that need to be done and can be put into a, a release plan. Uh, you certainly don't want to really do it before um, you know, a trial because then that information comes out and then, of course the prosecution will say, well, oh, this guy's very dangerous according to this. And so it muddies the water. So really the best point is post-conviction, pre-sentencing. Just as a follow-up, um, 
So you don't think a risk assessment should be done as part of putting together the fence? <coughs> Well, I mean, to be honest, I, I've done those two. <laughs> yeah, those are the cases I get, actually. Yeah. So, you know, uh, pre-trial. Pre well, we don't have anything to say in the guilt or innocence phase, except for rarely where a uh, minor is involved, and we can talk about uh, neurological development and how, how much farther folks have to go with that. Uh, but all we really have to, to do is, uh, is in the sentencing phase. I think that's the, probably the best point, is that we don't, we, we can't help with guilt or innocence, that's not our purview, that's the courts, and, and I'm no better at determining guilt or innocence than anybody else, so we really don't have much input there, that's true. Okay. I wish the that's Colorado ladies were here, I'm not an expert in this, I, I hear things, I go to their meetings, uh, I listen. He's talking about Colorado. Uh, did I hear uh, a dichotomy or a, a conflict about treatment? which is a big deal in Colorado. Uh, the expenses exploded through the roof on this treatment thing. And the legislature has actually authorized, if, if I'm correct here, $100,000 to analyze whether treatment is doing any good at all. Good. And, I, I, and so this, this is a good thing. And I said, let's find out who those legislatures are that voted for it, and let's talk to them. But uh, did I hear a... Uh, uh, conflict between yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Uh, California did the same thing, and I don't. It wasn't the study that uh, Chairman Blay was talking about. It was one where the legislature authorized them, at the Tascadero, to do a a randomly assigned control group study, and uh, and it went on for almost ten years, and they followed up for I think eight years, and. Uh, uh, they were very disappointed to find that there. So there, there are various factors. The main thing that uh, wiped out all of the research up till about uh, 19, uh, 2003 was uh, Rice and Harris's article criticizing Hanson, Sito, uh, Quincy, and all of those who had published a meta-analysis showing that there was a small beneficial treatment effect. But Rice and Harris pointed out that there was a fatal selection bias in their data, and I won't go into why, but that pretty much wiped away all of the outcome research up till about 2003. Hansen got busy and did another study. It wasn't a meta-analysis, but it went back over the records comparing, comparing folks who had not had treatment with those who had, and came to the same conclusion. There was no difference. There was no treatment effect that could be measured. Uh, that, as I understand it, is pretty much where it is. Hansen and Rice were both in, uh, I believe, Helsinki last year for a conference, international conference, presented and said, there is no hard evidence that we have a treatment effect. Lots of people think there is, but at this point, from my reading of the literature, uh, no treatment effect has been found. And it may be because we're treating everybody instead of uh, having a, a tiered system. Well, that's what, like, I, that's what I was going to say. It's yeah, so, so if you treat everybody, even people who didn't need it or couldn't possibly benefit from it, you're, of course you're not going to find any treatment effect. So Hansen, in his last uh, study, uh, took, took a, a, a a program from uh, a prison where they used the so-called RNR approach and had high-risk folks in the group and he thought that he had teased out some treatment effect and if that's true then it wouldn't surprise me but treating everybody is a racket is a what? A racket, he says. A racket. A racket. A racket. It's, it, 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 is a, it is a bird's nest on the ground, a full employment act for folks like me. <laughs> you ever get to testify to this type of uh, thing in any state or for any governing body? Mm, well, 
Not this issue. This is issue is. Uh, I don't know. I think Mr. Taylor and I are going to go back in the back and trade articles. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say. Let me add this one thing. I found research that shows putting high risk or putting low risk guys in treatment with high risk guys makes them worse. Yeah, sure. it increases their risk. So you know, you, that's that's a very good point. Is that you know the treatment has to match the need. That's exactly right. Instead of jail, how many children could we protect? And what is your view on that? Prevention versus punishment. Preventive therapy. What a novel idea. Okay, <laughs> gentlemen, this will close us out. Uh, empirically, I would say probably not many. Uh, because most sex offenders don't reoffend once they get caught. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I would say not not many girls would be or children would be protected because empirically based would tell me that once someone gets caught and goes through the just judicial system, they don't do it again. About thirteen to fifteen percent, depending on which research study you want to look at. It's it's amazingly hard to persuade the criminal justice system, the judges and the police and the DA that they do anything that's effective. They think it, they don't. They've got to pass it on to somebody else. But uh, most guys, first time offenders, have gotten all the treatment they need the day they walk out of sentencing. They're very, very unlikely to rape him. Before Sam, Dr. Geisen, let's see if Dr. Geisen has something to add. Just, just a couple of quick points. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Inhofe. I mean, the, the recidivism rate and, and Phil Taylor also it is very low. So I think the chances of it actually happening would, would be you know, would be very low. Someone recidivating. But to, to an earlier point of the previous discussion, let's not forget that that sex offenders uh, are a very heterogeneous group. Okay. Okay, and so when we talk about uh, treatment effects and outcome effects of treatment and not working, working and so forth, and I, I don't think that the resources are there to really support it, but I think really if, if certain, certain types of offenses were treated and did and do warrant different approaches to treatment and were approached that way, I think we would probably see a different set of results. Instead, what we often get in the community, what I see, is we get everybody lumped in a group, so you get you know, a person who's you know, had sex with a minor, with somebody who's a voyeur, with somebody who's an exhibitionist, with somebody who's a rapist, and they're all getting the same soup to nuts, soup to nuts approach, and then we're going, yep, doesn't work. Treatment doesn't work. Well, yeah, except that we don't have the resources really at our disposal, unfortunately, in a perfect world we would, to match you know, treatment with persons. Can I just say one thing? I hear this word sex offender all the time. In Colorado, we're trying to change the language. Yeah. It's a person who committed a sex offense. That's right. When I hear the word sex offender, I'm always committing offense. That's right. But if I'm a person who's committed a sex offense, uh, a few more syllables are pretty important. No, point well taken. Yeah. I've been really trying to change my label, yes, but yes. it's been so ingrained in me over the 20 years. Yeah. We, <laughs> so we I, have I like the term former. Uh, former. Former offender. Uh, yeah. 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 See, he's even telling me to cut it off. I'm, I'm trying with this group, Lloyd, but they're a handful. You heard the chickens, so this has been wonderful. Let's thank our uh, audience. Thank you all.